you know, and yeah, go ahead. I, I just want to um, punctuate Richard's talk here because he flew here today from New York um, and to be with his kid tomorrow morning. He's flying back tonight. So Richard gets another round of applause. <laughs> Um, yeah, my daughter is my current phase of my life, and, and uh, Books and Browsers used to be a couple of weeks earlier in the year, uh, right around her birthday, uh, and so in some ways my daughter's absence has always been a part, has always been a presence of this for me. Um, and, and in the talks that I was able to hear this afternoon, um, I was thinking about other uh, presences, not just the history of books and browsers itself, which while the subtitle this year may be telling small stories, I think you could say that books and browsers is an anthology that is culminating to be a very big story, um, but told humbly. Uh, and that's part of what I think is so important about it. Um, and, and it echoes stories of, 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 of my life of the last 20 years. I published uh, queer comic anthologies when I was a publisher, a book print publisher in the 2000s. And in the 1990s, I was an avant-garde theater director. Uh, and uh, when I walked in this afternoon, I was not expecting to see Anne Bogart's viewpoints uh, on a slide at a conference called Books and Browsers, but that's how special it is. And part of what was so charming for me about that is that the title of my talk is the title of a play a play by the sort of the madman in the attic of the American avant-garde theater, Richard Foreman, a play called Film is Evil, Radio is Good, which he wrote in 1987. Um, and what he was writing uh, about in that play, and his plays are very, in a certain sense, rarely about anything directly, but we infer what they're about, and it's obviously quite a provocative statement and one that I thought could be useful here. And this statement really has to do with viewing the battle between text and image, uh, a battle that is currently being fought in smartphones, um, but has been fought for basically as long as humans have been making culture and having arguments about how to represent that culture. Um, and, you know, one of the very, very first instances, you might say, of printing um, were the tablets given to Moses, uh, written by the finger of God. And much as we may feel that books have a kind of a spiritual or ecclesiastical dimension. They're not quite as powerful as two stone tablets. Um, but of course, why did we, what was going on while God was giving Moses uh, the, uh, the Ten Commandments? Moses' people were freaking out uh, that he was away and were getting very anxious. And to kind of soothe themselves, sort of like a like a baby's uh, transitional object, like a blanket, they built themselves a golden calf to venerate. They created an image in lieu of the word, and things did not go well. <laughs> uh, so chaos ensued. <laughs> um, uh, however, um, God, like any relatively benign publisher, <laughs> looked uh, ultimately with some uh, grace, if patronizing or even patriarchal grace, upon the audience slash flock slash author and said, well, we'll do a reprint. <laughs> um, and, and effectively, this is the beginning of iconoclasm, right? This is, this is just monotheistic religion number one, uh, the first instance <clears throat> of, of arguments over how to represent belief 
knowledge, culture, how to discuss it, how to interpret it. Um, you know, the next great moment, uh, there were a couple of, of, of iffy moments. There were a couple, of, uh, a couple of heretical cults in the Byzantine Empire that disapproved of all the images. Uh, but the next biggie was obviously the Protestant Reformation. Now, what's interesting about that is, is the Protestant Reformation plays a starring role in the history of print. Uh, in Elizabeth Eisenstein's The Printing Press as, as Agent of Change, uh, and, and in our overall understanding of the transformative power uh, of printing, of books, and of text. Um, but recent scholarship especially has been sort of emphasizing that as important as the ability to produce text without uh, a, a, a royal or, or Roman uh, interference uh, was the iconoclastic dimension, uh, the desire to destroy all representations uh, of religious belief, uh, largely uh, uh, as, uh, while appearing to be as a populist act, uh, ironically, uh, somewhat of an act of, if not the 10%, the 5%. It was basically urban mobs destroying rural uh, 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 churches. But there was, at least in theory, a more democratic or a more bottom-up uh, 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 vision, which was that each individual should be entitled to read the Bible and interpret it for his or her uh, in that world at the time, mostly his uh, self. Um, and that the hypothetical uh, 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 power of literacy, of printing, of uh, allowing texts to be made available to anyone to interpret them as they wish, um, was powerful, was tremendously powerful, even if in practice uh, it was as much an effort to destroy image as it was to build up text. Um, and then the, the third, I think, great wave of iconoclasm is one we've witnessed ourselves in the last couple of years, which was the destruction of numerous ruins of Jewish, Christian, Muslim, um, uh, 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 sites um, in the Near East by ISIS. Um, uh, uh, Islam, the third of the, the great monotheistic religions, having engaged to some degree in iconoclastic activities against other religions, the destruction of Hindu temples and of Buddhist temples, but also within, uh, 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 having an argument within, sort of an argument that is, in a certain sense, Islam's own in internal uh, reformation. But what you have then is, is, is in a very, very deep world historical way, uh, a conflict that is, is in a certain sense not dissimilar from uh, SMS versus uh, Snapchat. Um, uh, glib as that may sound. Um, uh, now, the interesting thing, however, about, about this sort of uh, somewhat glib opposition between uh, uh, writing uh, between textual and visual representation uh, is, that, is that in a number of areas uh, we, start, we, we have seen them come together. Um, and I think one of the most interesting early examples of that is as painting, as, as, as we reach the age of abundance uh, in painting, the age of abundance in painting having begun in the 18th century, uh, one of the interesting things that one had to start to deal with was um, uh, titling the damn things. Um, paintings up until the 18th and most even, even much of the 19th century had no name. Uh, the idea of something being untitled, uh, which is common today, was just the norm. Uh, paintings had no titles. And titles in painting uh, as photography comes in uh, to uh, uh, our society in the late 19th century is the caption. Um, and, and what you start to see going on here is, 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 is another kind of uh, way in which arguments about control uh, come into play. And you also begin to realize one of the troubling dimensions of, 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 of visual representation which is that it is difficult to critique an image with another image. If, if you want to argue with 
or critique or undermine or subvert or satirize or question an image, it is very difficult to do so by pairing it with another image. It's not impossible, uh, but it's very, very difficult. And what we by and large tend to do is pair text with image in order to do that. It's what we did, started to do as we started to create more images than we could keep track of. Uh, and as our ability to mechanically reproduce culture went from the printing press to photography to the movie, we encountered the same issue, which is that we made movies that were silent. But it turned out that silent movies on their own didn't really work. So what did we do before we invented the talkie is we just started adding text. So again, we have another image-only moment that can't quite sustain itself on its own and has to uh, pull in text in order to be able to sustain itself. And, and that is a, a process that has continued uh, up through Web 1.0 um, and uh, the present era of, of mobile stories where even Snapchat feels the need to tap to add a caption or uh, to have hacks around Snapchat that will create unlimited uh, uh, amounts of text. Yet, of course, even within that, if we look at the other sort of, uh, 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 sort of image-derived meme of the internet right now, the emoji, what the emoji we realize begins to do is sort of just take us back to something else that we should always have known, which is that in a certain way, text is itself an image. Um, uh, certainly in the West, where we had the Roman alphabet and 26 letters and the uh, imagistic dimension of letters was something largely restricted to poets and artisanal bookmakers, uh, in other cultures, the uh, origins of words in images uh, remain in the alphabet. Um, and so what, what I think this begins to suggest for us is that the debate which I followed yesterday on, on Twitter and uh, today actually a little bit in person, and, and debate maybe isn't the right word, but the, the ebb and flow the sort of the whirl of, 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 of conversation um, that has been going on here uh, around the relationship both between uh, this older form, the printing press, which was granted producing uh, 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 images alongside text, but is fundamentally associated with the creation uh, of text and text as, 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 as the mode for expressing and disseminating knowledge. Uh, and the, uh, all the other modes of reproduction, first analog, now digital, that are generating images and observing where the VC dollars uh, from both the north of this particular venue and the south of this particular venue are flowing, they're tending to flow toward images. Uh, so that rear guard action uh, that effectively begins uh, with God getting really pissed off at the Israelites and has continued in the uh, form of the Calvinists and, and, uh, and ISIS, uh, that rearguard action to attempt to obliterate uh, uh, images because they are seductive, uh, because they uh, are un, uh, uh, uninterrogatable uh, 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 by text. Um, is, is a tension that we need to be aware of as we play with multimodal and transmedia and multimedia and whatever uh, adjective we're gonna use to describe all these experiments we're engaged in. We're not just sort of comparing technologies and we're not just making arguments about uh, neurology. We're also engaged in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an epic multi-civilization argument uh, that I think it behooves us to be aware of as well. And if, if any of the foregoing sort of 
if there's any lesson, I think, to be drawn from the foregoing, it is to say that neither ever wins. By and large, images tend to always be in the lead, always running ahead because of ease of consumption, uh, because it requires less uh, brain processing on our parts, but text is never obliterated. It's, it's a race in which the uh, image is always in the lead and text is always behind, but there is no finish line. There is no point at what we get to where one or the other uh, is the victor. And if there is in some way some moment at which the fight may not matter anymore, um, I think it would be interesting to turn to McLuhan um, uh, for an understanding of, of where that might be. And one of the things that McLuhan, especially toward the end of his life, and especially in, of all places, in a Playboy interview he did in 1996, uh, talked about was to understand that, that media is effectively an extension of our central nervous system. Uh, uh, that they are um, uh, like a blind man with a cane. The cane effectively becomes part of the body. In other words, it starts to be, you start to see the beginning of what, what, what in other uh, conferences might be called the cyborg. Um, and what I think is the potential end game for the text versus image battle um, is effectively uh, telepathy. <laughs> um, and I thought it would be fun to, to, to sort of close books and browsers with um, a suggestion that the end game uh, is in fact no media whatsoever. Um, that the end game uh, effectively becomes that point in human history, whether 50,000 or 500,000 years from now, when there is no representation, where ideas um, not only are not copyrightable, uh, but there's no point in even rendering them in any fixed form because they're basically being transmitted from one brain to the other. And lest this sound utterly ludicrous, um, uh, the beginnings of work uh, 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 technological work is being done uh, around this. There was a test done last year or uh, 18 months ago uh, in which uh, three people in Kerala in India and uh, one person who I think was in Italy uh, transmitted thoughts to one another via the internet um, using brain, computer, interfaces on either end. Now, this was, as you might imagine, incredibly primitive. Uh, it basically involved the person speaking, as it were, uh, to um, think a hand or foot when watching a ball move across a screen. And as that hand, and as he did so, uh, if he was thinking, uh, if the ball went up, he was supposed to think hand. If the ball went down, he was supposed to think foot. And uh, 8,000 miles away, or actually a, a, a zero or a one was sent to three people 8,000 miles away. And uh, over the course of 140 bits, uh, two words were spoken, Ola and ciao. Uh, and that is the first <laughs> recorded human instance of telepathy, Ola and Chow. <laughs> uh, I don't really have a spectacular closing line with which to end that. <laughs> so I think I'll just say Ola and Chow.